All right, guys, what's going on? Appreciate you guys stopping by. So uh, today I feel a little bit different because people are now actually listening to this podcast. So I feel like the bed shooting potential is getting higher every day. A little scary, so hopefully I can keep a good product coming out. Um, I'm doing them pretty much every day, but I might um, do start doing them a couple of times a week or maybe once a week. It just kind of depends. <clears throat> um, I'd like to have a good idea every time we do this, and a, I would like to also have a, an idea that um, is completely original, and um, I don't think that that's uh, always going to be the case. Sometimes it might just be an idea that I see or I think about um, or I hear about that I maybe put a little bit of a twist on, but I think is an overall really good uh, business that somebody could start and um, potentially make a lot of money at. So that's kind of like the groundwork for my idea of the week. Um, it's just, it's going to be something good that I focus on. So <clears throat> anyway, so this week I think it's really good. It's something I, I, I kind of just stumbled across. It's pretty like, it's kind of a new thing, but I think you can make uh, absolutely a boatload of money on it. So there's a couple of things like when you're looking at a business um, to start or if you you have an existing business that you'd like, like to increase sales on or um, take in a new direction. And that is you want to think about like your potential customers. And when I had like my cleaning and my trash out business, this really wasn't anything that I had to worry about because that was more of a business to business thing. So I was just solving the problem of another business. So I didn't really have to think uh, too much about my uh, the, the people that I was serving because they were laying out exactly what they wanted from me. So it wasn't like I was guessing at what they wanted. They basically said, here's the things we wanted. Can you perform these services and for how much? So now that I'm selling real estate and flipping houses and doing remodeling, you really have to think about your consumer. And what I found is women spend a hell of a lot more money than men do. And they want things nice. They want things clean. They want things stylish. And really, I think that that should should be your target market. So even look at like a lot of like the biggest brands and who they advertise to or the most expensive brands and who they advertise to. A lot of the time, they're, uh, they're really crafting their marketing uh, to women or they're crafting their marketing to men who want to impress women. So I always say market to women and that'll make you money or market to men who want to impress women and that'll make you money. And a great place to look at this or a great, I guess, category to look at is health, beauty, and anti-aging. This is something that women have always traditionally spent tons of money on from makeup to clothing to supplements, uh, vitamins, stuff like that. And then I would say within the last maybe 40 years, men have really started to spend money on working out, supplements, um, I guess more like fashion trend kind of clothing. But but you also see, you've also seen the rise of uh, cosmetic surgery too, along with that. And it used to really just be women who were getting cosmetic surgery, you know, uh, breast implants was kind of the first big one. Uh, and now it's like Botox, I would count as cosmetic surgery, um, facelifts, things like that. Um, and now you're seeing like a lot of men do it too, but, it, but it's still predominantly women. And I feel like it's so common that everybody, probably everyone listening to this podcast knows people who get who have have gotten plastic surgery and probably know people who get Botox on a regular basis. And I feel like it, it's huge in the United States and it's also huge in a lot of other countries too. So it's just a gigantic market. And whenever there's a market like that, you know, we want to look at ways that we could possibly take advantage of it. Um, 
so that's what we're going to kind of do this week. Um, and I, I just, I've been thinking a lot about plastic surgery, cosmetic surgery, and even I would count like uh, veneers too in that, that category because that's an elective thing. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about that. And me and my uh, wife watch the show Botched um, whenever we catch it. It's just like people getting, sometimes it's people that are like just kind of basically normal people and they, you know, maybe got injured or maybe had to like a broke their nose and try to get it fixed. And these two doctors kind of fix it up for them. But then every episode they have someone who's just like a complete absolute freak and is addicted to plastic surgery, which I guess happens pretty frequently. And there's kind of like a reoccurring theme with people who are addicted to plastic surgery. And that is, um, it kind of like they start out getting normal stuff and then like they'll get one nose job and then they'll get a second nose job and then they'll keep wanting it corrected until like the skin is like so damaged that no one will do it. But what I've kind of found watching that show is no one will do it in the United States, but they always find some doctor in a foreign country that'll do it for them. And it's usually somewhere in Mexico, Latin, or South America, or like, seems like Turkey comes up a lot. <clears throat> so that kind of got me thinking. And my idea of the week, <laughs> believe it or not, with that lead in is plastic surgery tourism. And I, I guess that this is actually something that is pretty prevalent that I didn't know about. I guess, uh, according to some articles I read, I came across an article in Fashionista magazine or fashionista.com. And according to uh, research from Patients Beyond Borders, uh, the medical tourism market in 2020 will be worth $87.5 billion dollars. Each patient will spend about $3,400 per visit. And they kind of go into some different um, different costs as far as like what it would cost you in the United States as opposed to other countries. So, for example, a full facelift costs $11,500 on average in the United States. In Malaysia, it's, it's about $3,300. And in Mexico, it's about $4,700. Likewise, rhinoplasty costs around $4,800 in the United States, but in India, it costs you only about $1,400. So you can see the disparity, or the dis disparity, is that even the right word for that? You can see the difference, I'll dumb it down. Um, you can see the difference in prices there between the United States and these other countries. And remember... If you're getting elective plastic surgery, your insurance doesn't cover it. So the reason these people are going abroad for plastic surgery is it's cheaper, it's faster, it's cheaper, uh, it's faster, and they can, there's less hoops to jump through, right? So if you have money and you go to another country, you're more likely to get something done without having to ask answer uh, a ton of questions. So I think this this is obviously something that's really um, – oh, the other stat I'd like to share with you is it says um, – this is another source that it said in, in 2021, there's going to be an estimated 1.9 million Americans uh, getting plastic surgery abroad. So that's a huge market that you can tap into. And I, I tried to go around um, on the internet – and find some like companies or I guess like um, facilitators, I guess they're called, um, where you could say, hey, like this is what I want. Like how much is it going to cost me? Um, what all is included and everything like that. And I, I guess I found some of them and they, the ones I found online uh, honestly looked really, really sketchy. They kind of had themselves set up as like, um, I don't want to say fictitious, but like uh, a healthcare providing websites, which is like a, a little bit misleading because if you're going out of the country for plastic surgery, there's a reason you're, you're doing that because you want something that other, a doctor in the United States won't do or because you want something cheap. So like, why are we like beating around the bush? Um, with these company names and like websites that are kind of making it look like 
one thing when we all know what what's really going on. So <clears throat> there is some competition, but nothing. I didn't really see anything that really impressed me. So kind of how these companies work, from what I could tell in the limited like research and limited information that I could get, is they basically work like a tourism company where they sell you like a package um, to go to like Turkey, stay there for like X amount of days at like an all-inclusive like resort, and then also like plastic surgery is included. So like a little bizarre. But that's kind of how they're structured. Um. So if I wanted to get into this or you wanted to start a business into this, um, first of all, just a disclaimer, I'm not even really too sure like how legal this is to um, solicit clients from the United States to travel outside of the United States to get plastic surgery. Uh, It's not super ethical, but I'm talking about it anyway because it's an interesting topic to talk about. So um, I don't really know the legality of it. Obviously, you'd want to start there to make sure you don't get sued or make sure you don't get shut down or make sure you don't get drugged into court by um, somebody. Um, So first of all, the legal aspect needs to be researched. But if I was going to get into this, um, what I would do is I would just basically start off as I would call it like a facilitator or like a gatekeeper where I would reach out to a list of possible providers in foreign countries and I would try to I would try to find ones that weren't just completely awful. Like I would find real doctors in these countries. I'm you know, I wouldn't find somebody who's like, yeah, I can do it at like this hotel. So I'd find real real care providers in these countries. And then I would kind of try to find out like get a price list for them. Or like work out some deal where it's like if I send them a client, they would give me like a finder's fee or slap on like um, a fee on top of what they charge. So like basically like a markup. So if someone came to me that wanted like rhinoplasty that couldn't get in the United States and I sent them to doctor, um, I don't know any Turkish names, Um, if Smith, (laughs) the Turkish doctor, what would he quote that person or what would he put on top of his normal fee for me sending him a client? So you'd want to work that out on the front end before you send anybody clients anywhere. The other thing that you would want to do is wherever that doctor is located, you need to set up like a package of where, where your client would like fly into, where they would be staying, where they would be doing some of their post-operative recovery And that would depend kind of on what kind of surgery that doctor offered as far as like the recovery time. So that's one thing. The other thing is while you're figuring that out, you want to research your potential client list or you want to research the potential clients that you're going to be reaching. And um, I think that that would be fairly easy considering how big this market actually is. The market is actually even bigger than I thought. I had no idea almost 2 million people a year went out of the country for plastic surgery. But so I would start researching that. Obviously, um, like we talked about in the opening, I would probably uh, target females. I would probably target um, females over like a certain age, uh, people who follow um, certain Instagram pages, you know, uh, People who follow like maybe like Kim Kardashian because she obviously has had like a lot of plastic surgery. Things like that and do your market research there. But I would start um, researching that. I would start um, also advertising for potential clients and collecting their contact or email information to start building an email list. Because any company, any company you start or business you start like this. Um, that's going to be reoccurring or something that it's going to take a, it's going to be a process to sell these people on, right? You're not just going to like throw ads out there and the people are going to sign up. You're going to have to do some convincing. They're going to have to see your name and your product over a certain amount of time. So we want to start that, um, that uh, germination or that we want to get that process started as, as quickly as possible. So, Um, start building a a potential client list, 
start figuring out like who your service providers are, are, are and how much they're going to cost and start setting up what the logistics are going to be once you do um, start sending them clients and how you're going to get paid, everything like that. So once you get the facili- facility, I'm just basically calling this first section kind of, and the way you're going to start is is you're going to send out these emails, send out the, do this advertising. And then if somebody um, contacts you, uh, then you're basically going to like be selling directly. So that's going to be like kind of phase one. And I'm going to call phase one, like the facilitator phase. <clears throat> Cause you're just going to basically be acting as like a gatekeeper for Americans who want to go to Turkey or want to go to Colombia or Mexico, um, and get plastic surgery or elective surgery done. So you're kind of just going to be acting as a gatekeeper for a fee there. Once you have that up and running, what I would do is I would try to streamline it more so you're not actually the one who's doing the logistics or setting these things up. I would have them more like selling packages. So I would be selling like a package for like, if you want rhinoplasty, here are your options. Here are the times we can like fit you in. Here's the approximate cost of it. And then like, here's the cost to go get like an in-person consultation, things like that. So like I would really streamline it down um, with an interactive website where people can go, they can do research. And then the other thing I would do is when you're in the facilitator stage, what I would really try to do is I would really try to find somebody who's like on Instagram uh, or or Facebook uh, or YouTube who's like an influencer who has a really big following And I would try to get them to get plastic surgery or elective surgery if they're into that thing. Obviously, you don't want to like force somebody. But if they're into that kind of thing, try to get it, get them to use one of your service providers and go through you. And I would even like potentially like I would potentially give this person plastic surgery for free. So like if they wanted, let's say they wanted a nose job, you could send them to India or Thailand or something like that. It might cost you $2,500. But then in exchange for the money, in exchange for the nose job or whatever you buy for them, breasts or an ass lift or a Brazilian butt lift or whatever, um, they agree to like do so many like plugs for you and your service of, um, of plastic surgery tourism. And I would try to do that like a dozen times as you're making money, mix in some freebies for people who can like, who have a following that can influence others to use you. Because I think like, look at Instagram. Instagram is all, is tons and tons of, I mean, it's just, Instagram is basically all like visual. It's all eye candy. And if somebody built a big following on how they look, they're obviously their followers are very into the way they look. They could be into beauty, uh, anti-aging health, all that kind of stuff. And they're going to be really open to getting plastic surgery, to getting elective surgery. And if they know someone that they know, like, and trust who has used you, that's going to be like huge for you. So as I got those people in, they would be like a big part of my website, right? I would have their testimonials all over my website and, and video testimonials, everything. Try to get as much as you can out of that. <clears throat> but like I said, after the facilitator page, I would have it streamlined down to an interactive website where they can go through, they can pick where they want to go. They can pick like what uh, hotels they want to stay at. They can pick what kind of surgery they want. So I would really like think of it as like a travelocity for plastic surgery um, where somebody can just like do all the logistics for themselves. Like they, they can say like, Oh, I want to go this month from this day to this day and get this work done. And like, okay, there's a four seasons in this, in this town that I can stay out for this many days. So you would get, um, the commission from the surgery, um, as income, you would also get like a cut of the the way I would set it up is I would try to get a cut of like all the travel stuff too. So like airfare, um, hotel, rental car, if they got something like that. So if you could get something up and going like this, I think that this is, you could potentially make millions of dollars a year doing this because let's say, let's say you found somebody in 
let's say you found somebody in India to do rhinoplasties for you and they're charging $1,400. Well, maybe you could, if you say, you, I'll get you like a volume. Could I get a volume discount if I send you X amount per year? And they're like, yeah, I can do some kind of volume discount. So instead of $1,400, it's 1000 bucks. And then you you put a thousand or twelve hundred dollar fee on top of that thousand. I mean that can add up really quickly. You know if you're selling multiple packages of this a month, that's thirty to forty grand per month into surgery. And then the other thing is like the airfare and hotels. You can make a killing on that too. So, um, and then to my website, obviously I would have it like doing up sales, down sales, selling other things that aren't actually plastic surgery. So I'm going to have some beauty products on there, other things like that, or at least I would find a way to capture their email address and um, market market other products to them as well as just um, plastic surgery. So I think that... Um, I think this is a great opportunity. I mean, as long as it's legal, right? I mean, I don't know if it's legal. So that would be the first thing you want to check into. So, I mean, if you could get a little bit of a slice of this industry, um, and like I said, it's a $87.5 billion a year industry. So, I mean, it's a gigantic industry. And I, I really do feel like uh, plastic surgery, elective surgery, getting veneers, that's getting more socially acceptable every single day. More people are doing that. Um, even more men are getting Botox and stuff like that. So I think as we move forward, there, there's going to be more people doing it every day. It's not going to be like a, a freak thing or just for people who want something corrected. It's going to be to, to enhance, obviously. So anyway, I really like that. If you guys are interested in that at all, I think that, that, that that's something that you could really take advantage of. So... Pretty interesting, like off offbeat um, idea that I thought was pretty cool. <clears throat> like I said, as long as it's uh, legal. So um, <clears throat> shifting gears, well, um, sort of shifting gears. So next up is the deal of the week, and I say sort of shifting gears because the deal of the week is in Miami, Florida. So, um, but this is a, a title insurance company, and. I really like this title insurance. If you don't know what title insurance is, basically it's a insurance that you pay when you close on a house and it covers to make sure that there is no uh, conflicting ownership of a property, a piece of real property or a piece of land that you're buying. Make sure that there's no liens on it or anything. So you pay um, a premium when you um, buy title insurance that covers if there is a problem with the title that the title insurance company will clear those up for you and you won't um, get drug into court. You won't have to drag anybody else into court. Um, so it's basically just insurance to make sure you have a clear title to whatever you're buying, um, real estate wise. This isn't car, a car title, it's real estate. So this business, uh, it's, like I said, it's in Miami, Florida. It is, let me see what year it was started in. Um, I think it was started in 2008. Oh, no, established in 2000. Uh, it's in Miami, Florida. They're asking $2.799 million. It cash flows $742,000 a year off of gross revenue revenues of a little bit over $1.2 million. Um, they're renting the space that they're in right now for $3,500 a month. And... It says they have excellent relationships with realtors, mortgage lenders, developers, and other continuous referral sources. They have two offices and an additional satellite virtual office uh, that cover a large lucrative geographical market. For those of you listening who don't know anything about real estate in South Florida, um, the real estate market in South Florida is booming because all the time basically because there's literally people moving there all the time and people that move to Florida are generally people who retire um, from somewhere in the northeast it seems like generally New York City or they're just fed up with living in the northeast and they move to Florida so it's kind of like the northeast retirement or vacation spot basically 
And there's a lot of very expensive real estate there. Um, there's a lot of real estate development there happening all the time. Um, so this is a great, a great play. Like I said, it's been in business for 20 years, extremely strong cash flow. And they have six full-time employees and one part-time employee. All of the fixtures and equipment that they use in their office is included. Seller will stay on for a transitional period. And it says reason for selling, which I'm not crazy about, is owner is desiring to focus on his other successful business. If you'd like more information, you can call Robert Hugh at 727-793-0090. Now, the great thing about um, owning a title company is you're not making any sales. You're basically just making sure that it's a smooth, easy closing for the realtor. And if it is, they'll keep using you. So um, title companies and closing companies, things like that, if you have a good reputation in the community with realtors, uh, real estate investors, mortgage brokers, um, they can literally print cash. And that sounds like that one's doing pretty good. It's about 50%. Um, it's making about like a 50% return uh, or a 50% profit margin, uh, which is good. And a, a title company is basically you're just pushing papers. So I really like that one. Anyway, so my three critiques of the week. Oh, I have three critiques and then I have a bonus. And the bonus is really cool. <clears throat> um, so the first one is a girl I know and she wants to start a fashion blog. Now, I think a fashion blog could be pretty cool. I think that like just saying it's fashion though, that's like a pretty overreaching the, the, that's too big, right? Fashion is too big of a genre. So I'd really like to see if someone was interested in doing something like that, I would really like to see like them like niche down a little bit into one section of fashion. Um, I wear sweatpants on a t-shirt every day, so I don't know shit about fashion really. So I'm not the best person to ask about like what niche is the best. But I would say, like, take it down at least one niche from just fashion into something a little bit more specific a little that you can, like, drill down on and really try to be the thought leader in. Um, that's what I would do. And then um, I think a blog is good for, like, long form, um, like, articles and write-ups and, like, long form interviews there. But along with the fashion blog – you know, I obviously want to see something on Instagram. I'd like to see something probably on Facebook and I'd like to see some like videos and definitely pictures. So Instagram is pictures, right? Definitely pictures, maybe some videos from like a fashion show you go to, um, something like that. <clears throat> and I think blogs are good. I mean, you can get a pretty good following, but the thing with like a blog is at some point you do have to start making money. <clears throat> My wife has a friend and she has a fashion Instagram account or social media present. I don't really know what it is. I guess it's a fashion blog, but she gets really doesn't get anything from it at this point. I, mean, I think she's been working on it for like five years and she does, I think like a little like photo shoot kind of thing about maybe two or three times a week. I think I'm not really too sure. But she doesn't really make any money. I mean, she'll get like free clothes every once in a while. She was on, I think, Target's website, one something that she did. But she's really not making any money. So I would really start with kind of like the end in mind. Well, like, what are you like? What are you selling? How is it going to make you money? If you want to do it as a business, it has to. You have to find a way to for it to make you money. If you want it to be a business, right? So you really need to find a way to, to make money with it. And I, you can sell products. You can sell informational products. You can do advertisements. I think that would be a really, a really good one because within your blog or within your post, you could have links to um, where these products are sold, like Amazon links that you could get paid from. So I think that that could potentially be good. Obviously, you have to have a passion for it because you're not going to make any money for quite a while, right? So... I think that that could be good, but think about how you're going to make money before you get too far into that. So um, the second one today is um, not really starting a business, but it's more like um, 
I guess like buying into a business. So what it is is this person wants to um, to get to have like an either an all state or like a state farm or like a farmer. They want to be like a, an agent for either state farm farmers or um, all state, something like that. So property and casualty insurance. And I believe, I think like, I think kind of how it works is they like put you through some kind of school. I think this is how State Farm does it because I, I knew somebody who did this. And they put you through like some kind of schooling to to get your licenses and then like train you how to do it. And then I think that you have to like bring, I think it, I think it was at least 50 grand. It could be more. It could have been like 250,000 bucks. Um, to buy into State Farm to get your own State Farm practice. Um, and I, I'm sure like Allstate and Farmers is pretty similar with how they do that. I also heard like um, you could open a branch like under another agent if that agent like bought out another geographical area. Um, I knew somebody um, from Farmers and they were trying to like talk me into doing it. I was like, hell no, absolutely not. And not because I necessarily think it's bad. That's just not something that I would be interested in. Um, that's boring. So, but I think it could be good because everybody needs car insurance. Um, so like a state farm, they do like home, auto, life insurance. Um, I think that they do banking. I don't really know. I think that, I don't know if you bank through a branch or not. But so I think this could be good because those are all like pretty good name brands that have good name brand recognition. I think you can make a pretty good living. Do I think you could be, do I think you could get super rich or rich at all owning a state farm or an Allstate? No, not unless you're like the top agent in the country. So if you're in like the top 10% at any of those companies, you're going to be making good money, but you're going to be middle class. You're not going to make $20 million working there or anything like that. Um, so keep that in mind, obviously. I I don't even think you'd have to be like top five or 10% in the nation to even probably get close to breaking a million dollars. Maybe not. If I'm totally off on this, send me a message or put something on Facebook for me. But I doubt it. Um, and the reason is because you have like it. it so like State Farm... You used to be able to have a state farm agency and then you used to be able to like broker out any other kind of insurance. So <clears throat> one of my friends was like, he did like a, a property and casualty. Um, he worked for a property casualty company that recruited like independent insurance agents um, across the country to do different kinds of like property casualty insurance. And he talked to this guy, this kid basically, and this kid, he had like a he had like a, a property and casualty insurance agency where he handled only businesses. So he would like insure businesses, everything from like a, a one man painting sh um, shop to like a big manufacturing businesses. And he was like twenty one years old, and he had like a like a multi million dollar book of business. So my friend is like, well, how, how do you like, how, how do you, how are you doing all this business? This is like insane. Like how was that? Cause like, he was like 21. So he was like, how are you like doing all this? And he was like, oh, my dad is like the number three state farm um, agent in like the whole world. And it used to be that when you were, when you were a state farm agent, you could sell any kind of insurance, um, if like State Farm didn't provide it. But State Farm changed that to where you can only sell State Farm products. So what this guy did is he was like, well, I'm making a, like millions of dollars um, selling a, a business insurance to all these businesses. And I think they were in Los Angeles. And so he's like, well, I'll just like take all of this business and just give it to my son and I'll keep my State Farm business. So back in the day, you can make like a killing being a state farm agent because state farm would do all this marketing to drive people to you. And then you could sell them anything that you could like get your hands on basically. But now it's different. You can only sell state farm products. So you can only do um, basically consumer stuff. And as far as I know, state farm is basically priced out of anything commercial. So 
if I had like a huge manufacturing company, I couldn't go to just my state farm agent because they basically can't do that. So if you're a state farm agent, you're basically cut out from a pretty lucrative um, sub market of insurance. So I would keep that in mind. Could you make between a hundred and like $300,000 a year, like fairly easily because they're state farms driving people to your location? Yeah, probably. But now it seems like there's a state farm where I live. There's like a state farm on every corner, same with all state and all and these other companies. So I think for somebody who basically wanted a job with a little bit more upside than usual, it could be good. If you are a true entrepreneur and you have a drive to make as much money and be as successful as you can, might not be a great fit. Just depends on what you want to do. So that's a maybe. So two maybe so far. Um, <clears throat> the third one is a tutoring business. Someone was like, a, someone was a, that I know is a, a teacher and they were like, just be, I guess like fed up with all the bullshit of teaching, which my mom was a teacher and she lasted, I think like two years and she was an art teacher. So an art teacher, in like an elementary school. So it's not like she had parents coming in, bitching her out because her, her, you know, their kid wasn't like learning how to draw like a, a shape or something. So I know that being a teacher can be like sort of miserable. Um, you're not really getting paid that great unless you're, have been there a long time. Um, the other thing with being a teacher is like you're dealing with parents and you're dealing with kids who don't necessarily want to be there and their parents don't really necessarily care what they're doing. And the other thing that's kind of weird is like at at schools, high schools and stuff, um, the teachers have to like put up with a lot of bullshit like political stuff within the school. Um, so that's kind of weird. So this person is just basically like fed up with being a teacher and they're like, well, maybe I should just like tutor. So I could like tutor um, kids in like math, I could tutor kids in science, uh, any like grade basically. Um, the other thing is like I can tutor for like SAT and ACT prep. And I actually like that. Like, I think that tutoring for ACT and SAT prep, I think those are like pretty good because um, if you're a teacher, you can get your hand on like the um, the study guides. You can have like flexibility with when you like meet the kids. You could do it in the summer. You could do it on the weekends. Um, and, and if you're taking the ACT or the SAT, at least you're like somewhat motivated. So your students are going to be um, at least somewhat motivated. Um, and then if the the kids' parents are willing to pay for tutoring, then that means that they care. So I know like if you're a teacher, you want your pupils to give a shit. So I think that could potentially be good. I don't really know how much money you could charge for tutoring. Um, I took like a, a test prep thing for like the LSAT after I graduated college and I remember that being pretty expensive. I, I think that was like $2,000 to do that. And just like college, it was kind of a joke. They just gave you a book and you just read the book on how to do, like take the test. So um, I think if you want to do a, um, a tutoring business, ACT, SAT would be really good. Um, STEM would be really good. It would be actually even better if you could get into um, tutoring for like post-secondary stuff like um, MCAT, LSAT. I think test, I think test prep is a little bit better than just straight up tutoring. Um, and I don't really, I'm not really too sure how much money you can make doing that. If you could get into the post-secondary stuff where you're charging $2,000 and you could fill a room with 30 kids, that's totally worth it. Um, I know that there's like Kaplan franchises you could get into with that. Um, but maybe if you, um, we're a little bit cheaper. You could steal some people away from things like Kaplan. So I, I think, and I think people are getting more into like having their kids tutored as well. So I think there is a lot of angles that you could work with that. I think that that could actually be pretty good. And, and if you are tutoring, I think you could handle like a, a pretty large amount of like kids per week. Uh, especially now with zoom and stuff, you could leverage technology where you wouldn't necessarily have to be there in person. So I like that. I think that's good. I think you could make money at that. I think you could scale that. So um, that's a thumbs up for me. Tutoring tutoring or test prep business is good. So the bonus, and I don't have a lot of like 
all the information yet, but I wanted to talk in this episode about it. And then uh, these people that I know are thinking about buying. They're thinking about, and I don't have all the financials for it, but I just really, lo- really like the concept. They're thinking about buying three haunted houses. <laughs> and the house, the, they're not really houses. Two of them are like basically abandoned commercial buildings in the downtown uh, area. And then the other one they just put up as like, it's like a tent. Uh, that they put up kind of like in the suburbs and have people go through. And um, they're not asking like a ton of money for them because obviously it's seasonal. Well, it's only one holiday, right? It's Halloween. So you basically get like a thir- about a 30-day buildup. Um, I think that they're asking like around 380000 for all three buildings or the two buildings and then the like tents basically. And then um, the rest of it is like sort of self-explanatory. So there's not a lot to it. Like you keep the lights dark. There's some like props and stuff that go with them. But I thought that that was like really interesting. And um, like I said, I don't have the like financials right in front of me, but I guess that they average the ones downtown like do okay because like downtown isn't like a lot of like kids or high school kids they do like okay they pull in some they pull in some high school kids and some college kids that like want to go to a haunted house and then drink and i think that it's not terribly expensive i think the ones downtown are like 20 bucks per person they maybe get on like a good night a couple hundred people but the one like out in the suburbs actually like does pretty well the one out in the suburbs um i guess like last year that one made them like 40 grand so I guess the big thing is it's just something that you would have to try to really drive the customers to because, I mean, they're basically the way these people are doing it. The sale is they're just doing like an asset sale because they don't, it was just something that they kind of like did for fun and they didn't really make much money at because they like overhired way too much staff and it wasn't ran like as a business at all. It was just ran um, as something that they like thought was like fun to do, which it, th- that sounds like a nightmare kind of because there was like a lot of staff at each location. So that doesn't really sound like fun to me, but I guess they were just really into Halloween. I don't know. Excuse, eccentric, rich, weird people, I guess. <clears throat> but, um, I think that that could be really good because the like ones downtown are like kind of in like, you know, old, like kind of creepy, creepy buildings. Um, but I think that that's like a, a pretty interesting concept. And I think the one in the suburbs, like you could, I think you could like double the amount of people there um, each year with the right kind of like build up and stuff. There's a lot of other ones in town that run like um, TV, radio, um, ads, ads on Facebook and like really drive people. I don't like haunted houses. I don't, I don't like t- people touching me in the dark. Um, I guess I'm like a, kind of a pussy when it comes to that. Well, I think it's mostly because when I was like a little kid, I was like 12. I lived in Missouri and like the big thing was, and I, this is what I would do with these is there was this like haunted house and it was called silo X and the people that put it on, like they did a really, really good job of like really building up, building this thing up saying like, and like kind of like spreading rumors almost where it was like Hollywood makeup, like, uh, sets from Hollywood movies, like super scary. Like you had a sign and then they did like a really good job. Like when you were there too, of like really building up, like how scary it was going to be and making you like sign all of these, um, all these things that say like, you know, if you have like a metal breakdown after this, like we're not held responsible. So I did that when I was like 12 and it, it scared the hell out of me. Like I was like crying my eyes out, like a, a little kid. Well, I got, I was a little kid, but so it was really, really scary. So I don't really like haunted houses, but I think if you did something like that, where you did like a, a, a lot of build up and then like really try to get people freaked out before, then I think like word would get around in the haunted house community where you could like maybe double or triple the amount of people you, you got there. So like I said, last year, if it was, it, I think, uh, it did like 40,000, the one in the suburbs, so if you could get that up to like 120,000 and you're only paying 380 for all three of these buildings and you can keep your expenses low, I think it could be good. Um, 
I think it's a really cool concept. I think that um, it, it's like a fun concept if you could make enough money at it, but I don't know. So um, I'll keep you guys up to date with that one. I'm sorry I don't have more information, but I just wanted to talk about it because it's so bizarre. But anyway, um, if you guys have any questions or if you guys have any businesses that you'd like me to critique, if you guys need any business ideas, or if you have any um, questions about anything we went over, uh, like the plastic surgery travel business, um, shoot me a message. Um, my email is theideaaddict at gmail.com, and we'll catch you guys next time. Thanks.